Great, hello everyone. My name is Eric Caleri. I'm the client curator for theater and performing arts here at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm with my friend and colleague, this is Beth Burns. She's the artistic director and matriarch of the Hidden Room Theater. Uh, Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I've been purposefully not looking at your side of the desk and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you have. <laughs> I'm really curious. We've got some great goodies to share with you today. This is, uh, we're gonna be talking about John Wilkes Booth's prompt book for Richard III and a new staging of it. It's the first time that it's been staged since the 1860s. Uh, Hidden Room Theater is bringing it back to life in a really interesting way. And so we're going to be talking about how that happens and what we learn from doing that, actually, from going uh, from the, the research in the stacks to uh, the stage. Mm -hmm. So Beth, maybe we can start if you want to tell us a little bit about Hidden Room Theater. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'd love to. Um, so Hidden Room Theater, we're based in Austin, Texas. Um, we specialize in a couple of different kinds of theater. Uh, the kind of specialties that we have that relate specifically to this project is a lot of times we'll work with scholars to um, see if we can resuscitate the ghost of a historically significant piece of theater or work with a lost uh, bit of theatrical practice. So for example, this particular project, we're working a lot with theatrical gesture as we think it may have been used in the 1860s. We're also working a bit with voice using some of the extant um, uh, wax cylinder recordings that we have from the period um, and trying to um, employ some of that same uh, technique. We also, from your collection, have learned quite a bit about um, acting technique from the period using actual acting manuals and trying our best to use those um, just like we'd use an acting manual today or a book from college on how to be an actor um, and do our best to recreate that training and therefore recreate that practice. So we've taken this kind of work uh, to places like Shakespeare's Globe in, in London, uh, the Shakespeare Institute, uh, Oxford University, universities all across the United States. Um, but Austin is our home, and we're really proud to be able to be, um, in a way, uh, ambassadors for the type of scholarship and practice that's relatively rare and yet comes from Austin. Great. Uh, just recently, you won the Austin Critics Circle Award for Henry Fourth. Congratulations. Thank you. We did. We did. Um, when our, our fellow nominees were uh, stellar, so we were especially honored to, to get that, um, uh, that, that recognition. Yeah. And you've also done Nahum Tate's King Lear, the, the sort of happy King Lear. Mm -hmm. You've done puppet versions of Hamlet mm -hmm. uh, from German scripts. Uh, the uh, world-renowned Tiffany Stern uh, led us through Strafter Brudemord, forgive my German, um, on recreating what a puppet show would have looked like in 1700 using what we believe was a German puppet Hamlet from the period. And then we did Tate's Lear using restoration practices to the best of our ability. Uh, with the scholarship of uh, Stern and also fair Karen Cooper from the Globe, uh, exploring restoration gesture and, and and it's been interesting for us to see the uh, the through lines how how theater goes from uh, from early modern we've done a lot with early modern practices into the restoration uh, and now into reconstruction Civil War era uh, into where we are now. I've been so excited about this project. This is really. I've been here at the Harry Ransom Center now for three years, and this, this project has really spanned the entire time that I've been here and in the length of our relationship, which yeah. it's, it's been fantastic to explore this with you. Oh, it's been fun. And you found, didn't you find this not long after I, you arrived? I did, yeah. And I wanted to mention, too, uh, if you're watching this live, uh, feel free to type in some questions and we will answer them for you while we're, while we're chatting. Uh, if you're watching this recorded, you can still type questions. We'll try to get those answers to you uh, in text. Uh, at some point in the future. Uh, but thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, yeah, so I, I came across this uh, just after I came here. Uh, one of our uh, graduate interns at the time uh, was doing a small exhibit here on the second floor of the Ransom Center uh, on sort of hidden, hidden collection items from uh, something called the Little Alphabet Collection, which is an A to Z collection here at the Ransom Center that's uh, full of really interesting and exciting items. Uh, usually, it is a one-off kind of a thing. We will have like maybe two or three letters from George Washington in this, this collection, not enough to make an entire box worth of something. Uh, we have several wonderful photographs of John Wilkes Booth and some material related to him in other parts of the collections, but really one major manuscript item, and this was the prompt book for Richard III, his own personal production prompt book. 
A prompt book is, uh, for those of you who, who are unfamiliar with the term, it's not something used very often anymore. This is actually uh, John Wilkes Booth's prompt book here. It captures all of the technical notes for the production, the curtain cues, the music, the lighting, the sound, uh, and it also uh, includes the acting notes. So uh, in the case of um, the entire production, all of the actors, it will include their entrances and exits. It'll include uh, the, the fight choreography for the battle scenes. And so really, uh, very little has survived from John Wilkes Booth's uh, theater, his, his performance work. He was an incredibly popular actor at his time. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of the material that was, that was left over after the assassination of Lincoln uh, was destroyed, either intentionally or accidentally. Uh, so the fact that this even survives is a really remarkable thing. Uh, so one of our graduate interns had put this out on display, uh, and we were just getting ready to do a major exhibition on Shakespeare, the 400th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare here at the Ransom Center. And I was on the hunt for prompt books and looking all over the collections, and this one had already been pulled uh, for this display. And I thought it was incredible that some, something like this existed. A lot of people look at these and they think of them as just marked up books. Mm -hmm. Like you would get, uh, maybe someone who was just reading a script might mark it up and just have their thoughts in it or uh, little notes that they're taking while they're reading. Uh, and so they often get dismissed, especially in libraries and archives, because people don't realize that when it comes to performance, especially early performance, this is one of the best records we have of what this looks like. Yeah, that's right. It's like having a director uh, from the past come into your rehearsal room and tell you what to do. Um, in Booth's time, we're looking at a star system where he'll send out this prompt book to the theater that he's going to go visit um, a week or so in advance. The actors that are already waiting for him will learn uh, their parts, learn the blocking. They'll, also, they'll already have a pretty good idea of what the story is. They'll have, a, you know, Richard III works a certain way. We all know, you know, you better have an envious mountain on your back and, uh, and there's certain things that we expect. So they have a pretty good idea and then they get the specific direction from here. So then for the Hidden Room to be able to have access to a document like this that's so, um, so thorough in his stage directions, it's really helpful to be able to uh, even though, you know, our director is a monster, which is something that we have to keep sort of grappling with, um, it's really interesting to have somebody from the period come and go, oh, here's where you should enter and this is what your setup should be like and, um, and uh, this is when you move. Uh, it's been, it's, and the stage directions have actually been really smart. Sometimes our instincts have gone a different way. Uh, there's a very specific entrance for Richard that I thought, oh, is that an error? And then I realized, oh no, that's actually really smart and menacing. So we've, we've just stuck to exactly what, what Booth said to do, and we're doing it. Yeah. I want to mention that this is a really different Richard than what most people would expect to see on stage now for a lot of different reasons, not just because of John Wilkes Booth's notes. Uh, but uh, this actually, this entire prompt book has been digitized and it's available on our website. Uh, it's hrc.utexas.edu, and you'll look for the digital collections, and, uh, and you'll find that there. It is really an extraordinary document. The, the play script itself is from Samuel French. <laughs> they've been around forever, it seems like, uh, so shout out to Samuel French. Uh, they've been providing acting scripts for, for well over two centuries now. Uh, this is... Shakespeare's Richard III, but it's adapted in the Restoration in, in 1699. 1699 by Colley Sibber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and tell me about that. So this is sure. This changes it quite a bit. It does. So so Sibber's version. Of, so in the Restoration, uh, for political reasons and also matters of taste, um, a lot of Shakespeare's plays are taken and revamped. Um, in the case of Tate's Lear, for example, they took a. a a heap of unpolished jewels and fix them. Uh, <laughs> There's always these prologues where they, the playwrights have to explain why they had to mess with the bard, mess with the master mm -hmm. poet. It's to improve it. It's, it's just, just to because, make it better. Yes. And, and, uh, and it's not that shocking because we do that all the time. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, oh, it's uh, how long? And we, you know, take an axe to it. So Sibber uh, decides to improve 
And, uh, and frankly, he makes some really interesting decisions that I really like. And it's also, again, really telling of the restoration. Um, there's some confusing bits for anybody that knows Shakespeare's Richard III particularly well. There's a couple, there's one real big head scratcher when Lady Anne makes a turn. She makes an un, uh, unexpected turn towards forgiving Richard. And, um, and it's shocking and it's a very difficult scene to play, although I think we've got it figured. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and Cibber fixes this by having uh, Lord Stanley and his character Trestle in the background saying, can you believe what you're seeing right now? <laughs> and uh, Lord Stanley's like, yep, you're seeing a woman. It's terribly misogynistic. And, and ironically, uh, then at some point, it looks like Booth cuts those lines. Mm. Um, so you can again see the, the, um, the, the through line of taste, theatrical taste. Yeah where you can tell, uh, it looks to me like Booth says, oh, well, that's ridiculous, that's cheesy, let's not do that. So Sibber cuts so much of Shakespeare. There's actually only like 800 lines of Shakespeare's original text mm -hmm. that's part of this. The story's largely there. Mm -hmm. It's main, the, the general overarching story is, is the same as Shakespeare. And they called it, uh, reviewers called it the blood and thunder Richard, mm -hmm. right? Or there was the action Richard, what is it? I think it's Blood and Thunder, yeah. The Blood and Thunder Richard, because it's fast-paced, it's much shorter than the original Richard. It's audience-friendly. Uh, it's very clear what's going on, it's black and white, it's melodrama. They introduce actually some of the Henry plays into the beginning, which oh, is really interesting. Right. Uh, the whole first scene is not Shakespeare's first scene, it's it's uh, sort of like last time on Richard. From, uh, that's right, the, from the, the Henry the Sixes, yeah. yeah. And you get to see uh, the, the demise of poor Henry VI, which is great, yeah, to have that little intro. It, it catches people up, it makes good sense, uh, and it's good theater. And the other thing that I think is really interesting now that we've really been diving into the text is recognizing so much of Shakespeare from other plays in this play where I think Sibber is just like, oh, that's a good line. Yeah. I'll take that from Henry IV, the Henry Sixes, from... Um, I saw one in there from uh, Richard II. So he really, he takes them from wherever he can get them. Uh, and, and I wouldn't have even recognized it, I think, had I not been you know, reading it aloud and going through it. I think uh, it's so important to realize that this Kali Silver adaptation of Richard III is really the Richard III that audiences would have seen for over 200 years. So for the bulk of the time of the death of Shakespeare to the present, up until about the late night late 1800s, mm -hmm. uh, this is really the Richard that people would see, mm -hmm. not Shakespeare's. And now you never see it at all, which is, again, one of the things that's really, really exciting about what you're doing at Hidden Room. Oh, thank you. Oh, and uh, speaking of, so uh, we're a few minutes in, so just again, I'm Beth Burns from Hidden Room Theater. I'm Eric Calari, the Curator for Theater and Performing Arts here at the Ransom Center. We're talking about our collaboration on uh, John Wilkes Booth's prompt book of Richard III, and we are eager for your questions. So if you have any, um, just Facebook them in, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So just going a little bit further before we move into some other items on our table, uh, this is actually John Wilkes Booth's handwriting, his own handwriting. Uh, so this is opened up towards the end on the battle scene, uh, the famous Battle of Bosworth Field. So you can see it's <laughs> heavily annotated. Uh, there's really interesting moments, like you said, with the, the shifting of taste in theater at the time. Uh, Booth is actually bringing back some of Shakespeare's original dialogue. That's right. Uh, he, there's one bit where he says to bring back a prayer. He, oh, there's a line, there's a great line, although I'm not, here's the other thing. This particular edition isn't straight Sibber either because it's the cut that I think came from Keene. Keen. Yeah, from the yeah. 1830s. So there's multiple layers of revision <laughs> uh, from Samuel French before we even get to the John Wilkes Booth edits, which, which yeah. are significant. So in Sibber's version, uh, the princes are uh, murdered on stage, the young princes, which is certainly not in Shakespeare's original that I recall. I don't think you kill the princes on stage. And then in this version, it's gone. Right. Um, but the line that's restored, there's a great one. What is it? If, is the is the throne empty? Is the king dead? Uh, and he popped that one back in. Yeah. It's smart. I mean, it shows that the, the styles are beginning to change. And it's actually John Wilkes Booth's brother, Edwin Booth, who reintroduces the folio versions of Shakespeare into American theater. After the assassination of Lincoln, Edwin Booth isn't sure what to do with the rest of his career. Mm -hmm. He goes to London. Um, he's trying to figure things out. He sees Henry Irving performing at the Lyceum. And Irving has already brought back the folio versions of Shakespeare, and it is blowing people's minds. It's so much longer. Uh, 
t the the King Lear is actually not a, a comedy. It's it's it's, it's not a, happy. It's, it's a so dark sad. dark tragedy, and it is it is flooring people for the first time that this is really what Shakespeare was writing, and so uh, Booth Edwin Booth thinks this is remarkable buys a copy of the second folio in England, comes back to the United States and decides to model the rest of his career off of what Henry Irving is doing in London. He stops touring across the country, he buys a theater in New York, and he just performs at that one theater from, from then on in repertory productions. And that's actually just a really quick side note that I think yeah. is important, is that, is that John Wilkes Booth himself was not only a, a, an important actor. Did we already talk about this? His, no, his, his whole legacy. family, absolutely. Yeah, so his father actually was a really famous actor. Uh, this is Junius Brutus Booth Sr. So father of three actors, uh, actually four. Asia Booth Clark is the sister. The oldest brother is Edwin Booth. The middle child is John Wilkes Booth. And the youngest is Junius Brutus Booth Jr. Uh, this is actually Junius Brutus Sr. Uh, as Richard III. And images, prints like these are really useful actually because uh, there aren't that many photographs, especially the actors in costume. So the prints give us a sense not only of the costumes that they were wearing, but also something of gesture, which mm -hmm. has really been important to your exploration. It's been very important to us. That particular picture was helpful because we understood uh, there was rumor that uh, that uh, Junius left his trunk of costumes to John Wilkes. So we were able to uh, model our cloak, which we made, uh, Jenny McNee, uh, who's our fantastic costume designer, she then uh, drew these sketches up, um, lightly basing uh, from critics' reports on what the, uh, the costume may have looked like, and then using that coat, saying that it did indeed in the extant um, documents say that it looked like Junius's. So we made it. <laughs> yeah, it's actually an interesting story that, that Junius Brutus Booth Sr. Uh, when he passed away, the, the trunk of costumes went to John Wilkes, which was the second son. It should have, by sort of tradition, it should have gone to the eldest son who was going into acting, which would have been Edwin Booth. And the story is, is that it infuriated him so badly that he left the East Coast completely, went out west, came to Austin, Texas, actually performed here, uh, performed uh, all over California uh, and throughout the West uh, while John Wilkes Booth was starting his career um, in Virginia, Maryland, DC, New York, uh, with with his father's costumes. I will also say that uh, I read from a document that you had here that um, that John Wilkes was really interested in costumes looking really pricey, and that he spent more than uh, other actors would have normally spent. So we really took care to make some really extraordinary costumes. Um, this is another thing. Uh, that uh, this is Lady Anne's headdress, for example. I just, I'm so impressed with Jenny McNee. She's making such beautiful work. Uh, and this is a sketch, because I don't want to show you the real thing yet, of what Queen Elizabeth will look like. Um, you know, so it's a mix of the historical documents and then mostly just the research that we get uh, from you guys. Because we also have Edwin Booth's, uh, a print of Edwin Booth in, in costume as Richard III as well, which is a very different uh, Richard than his father's. Uh, it's a simpler mm -hmm. armor, um, he doesn't have a, a beard and a mustache, he's very clean shaven and young looking. Uh, I also want to point out this is the three brothers, uh, John Wilkes Booth here uh, on your left. The center is Edwin Booth and then Junius Brutus Jr. This is the only time that the three brothers performed uh, together on stage, they performed Julius Caesar as a benefit for the building of the Shakespeare Memorial Statue in Central Park. Um, and it's also one of the only photographs that we have of John Wilkes Booth in costume, and sadly it's for Julius Caesar, which is uh, such a very different time <laughs> period than what we're looking at here. Uh, but it is, it is helpful for, to see him in costume. A uh, really incredible acting family, um, and we should maybe also talk a little bit about the star system and what that was like, because that also really influences the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, here we have a letter actually from John Wilkes Booth, it's handwritten, uh, to Benedict DeBar, who was a theater manager in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and basically, John Wilkes Booth is writing to get a gig. He is uh, traveling across the country from 1859 through about 1864, and he is, uh, he's trying to get about a two or three week run at a 
repertory theater in cities across the country. Uh, he goes as far west as Leavenworth, Kansas. He, uh, he's all over the East Coast. Uh, and basically, that theater company will have their own stock group of actors, and they will be performing their own shows most of the time. Uh, and then you'll get a star actor who comes in and bumps the main actor down a level mm -hmm. uh, so that he can come and do his repertoire of plays. Uh, Richard was always part, it was usually the, the piece that he performed first. It was his most famous tragic piece. And then weren't you saying also that, that, he, that a, the star that would come through would do multiple shows a week, so sometimes six shows oh in a week, six different shows, six not, different not shows. six performances of Richard. Yeah. When you only have two weeks to, to really perform, you're trying to get as much range as possible. So you're, you're going to do a romantic piece, like for John Wilkes Booth, it was The Marble Heart. You're going to do a comedy, you're going to do a tragedy. You want to really showcase your range uh, to audiences and also critics. And the critics were actually really positive to John Wilkes Booth. This has been one of the real challenges, I feel like, in our research together is we don't, it's hard to tell what is true and what isn't. You have to really look at contemporary reports from that, that period because so much gets colored after the assassination. Mm -hmm. So we do have, I'm going to try to get this up off the paper so you can see it a little bit. Uh, you're not going to be able to read this on the camera, uh, but this is a small newspaper clipping, uh, a review of John Wilkes Booth and Richard III, um, where oftentimes they're, they're really saying that he's distinguishing himself uh, from his, his father's performance, uh, that he's providing a really exciting new interpretation of Richard III. It's very real, it's very dramatic. This is something that's really uh, important, I think, about understanding American theater in the 19th century is that realism reigns. This is not a new thing. This doesn't come with uh, method acting in the 20th century. This is really part of American theater history. And using those types of reviews from your collection, it's been really helpful for us and understanding the idea of naturalism because if you think about, if you ask yourself what's the worst part of theater, people will or make fun of bad theater for me. And inevitably somebody's going to go, huh? Yes. Right? Um, which is theatrical gesture. And, and remembering that notion of realism and naturalism, that's one of the things that we've taken in this particular process to understand, and also looking at photographs of the actors from the period and all this beautiful emotion, and yes, these long extended gestures. Oh, I have this, this, can, this might be helpful. This is uh, just from the period. It's of, of uh, an actor, it's a, a French painting of an actor engaged in, in some theatrical gesture. I think this was from 1863 or 1864. Um, but, but looking at the stories that each of those gestures tell, and then looking at photographs uh, of actors from the period and their beautiful faces and how much emotion they're expressing. So we realized that as opposed to, to restoration gesture where it seemed more influenced by ballet, it looks to us like reconstruction gesture, or at least the reconstruction prompt book works best when we start with the real emotional truth. Mm. And uh, our good friend Robert Matney, who's playing uh, Buckingham in this production, he says he calls himself like a, it feels like a teapot, mm. and he lets it simmer and simmer and simmer and get as real as it could possibly get until the gesture's there mm. and it strikes out. And to a pose, it looks like that. So let's take a moment, actually, and, and, and look at that for a second, because I think this is also key, and it builds off of what you've already been working on. So for, uh, for the, thank you, we've got oh, our first question, we'll, we'll grab that in a second. So you, when you were tackling uh, Nahum Tate's King Lear as a restoration play, these were sort of very big gestures that were moving one into the other mm -hmm. seamlessly yes. in some cases. Mm -hmm. It was stylistic, it was balladic, you said. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the difference with this, can you give us an example? Sure. It seems when we're reading the script, and based on, the, this is going to sound odd, but based on the stage directions that we're getting, uh, the very limited stage directions that we have, it works best and it's most effective when it's more of a in character it's like soap opera acting it's melodramatic acting it's um it's being in character plus plus five <laughs> and then being natural being natural being natural and strike um as as opposed to this and this and this and 
Now, Beth Burns, people are going to say that this is really going to be cheesy, that this is so <laughs> old and so stylistic that nobody's going to like this and it doesn't work. So why are you doing this? I, that's exactly why I do it. <laughs> I get so excited when people say that because um, it just like takes Lear or uh, Sibbers Richard. People always are so quick to dismiss it as inferior. And then I always ask myself, well, why do people love it so much? If, if gesture was so terrible and cheesy and ineffective, why do people eat it up? Why are there paintings of people watching this type of work with their faces white and um, shocked or thrilled? Uh, we certainly, I, I think we can all agree, we haven't gotten any smarter. <laughs> so if we haven't gotten any smarter um, and tastes have merely uh, changed here and there, should still be effective, I would think. Yeah. I, I so love it. It's a challenge. It's, it is actually... Uh, it's, it helps the audience. It helps ground them in the text in a really interesting way. Yeah. Um, it, you had mentioned that also audiences are sort of emotion hungry. So if you think yeah, about like our fascination with roller coasters or with horror films, mm -hmm. or these things that bring us to the, the edge, the cusp of, of you like, get to see the emotion. very best and worst of humanity expressed. We, we know that um, Junius Brutus certainly did this at parties as a party trick. He would run through the passions mm. and show his incredible emotion, and uh, ladies would faint, and uh, we know Garrick did it as well. This was a popular thing for big actors. And these are the passions. So the passions uh, are really uh, the different emotions that you would go to that have a specific gesture attached to it. And these gestures are uh, vocabulary, really. So sort of... it would be like it would be like if uh, if you had Ian McKellen at dinner and he was like you know sadness and he shows you the most incredible sadness. You can like and then he Ian immediately goes, yeah, and he can anger. He goes through everything for you. Bless him. Let's uh, let's take some questions though, uh, and please feel free to continue Ooh. posting them as they come up. So Joe Joe wants to know uh, what do you think of the character uh, Richard in Sibber versus in Shakespeare. Mm. It's really interesting. You might be better to answer this than I am. I've been purposefully unlearning all I have learned about <laughs> Shakespeare's Richard so yeah. that I can really focus on this. But I can tell you that in this version, he certainly um, grapples even more with uh, the gnawing, um, the gnawing uh, guilt that seems to be uh, uh, creeping in and then he pushes it away. He's a lot more black and white. Um, uh, Sibber inserts the famous line that we kept for a long time, off with his head so much for Buckingham. But he says about, you know, his once right-hand man. So it's, he's a lot more, he's more of a melodramatic villain. And at the same time, in many ways, he's more sympathetic. You really get on his side. So that's the blood and thunder. That's what makes us the blood and thunder of Richard III as opposed to Shakespeare's. Uh, this is, yeah, very stark black and white. So then one of the things that makes Shakespeare so appealing to American audiences in the 19th century is this fascination with moral, mm -hmm. uh, moral righteousness, that there is very clear good and evil in the world. And so for, for Sivers Richard, this gives you a very clear tyrant uh, who isn't just a tyrant, though. He's actually also really savvy politically. Mm -hmm. He gets things done. Uh, he's sort of remarkable and admirable in that way, uh, and yet also a, a very clear villain. Uh, and audiences find that tension really interesting. And I think John Wilkes Booth certainly clearly found that clearly. Uh, tension really interesting. Otherwise, I mean, this is his signature role. This is his tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's what he he opens his shows with and and shows off his chops. And there was a there was I think a fellow actor that that remarked that at the end of the week after finishing up that uh, they would find John Wilkes Booth normally a very fit man uh, in a in a puddle on the floor just out of exhaustion because he put his all yeah. into this. It's interesting too because the reviews and the, the memories, the memoirs of actors who worked with John Wilkes Booth said that he was a really lovely person to work with, very kind, uh, that he gave really good feedback. He did the whole sort of sandwich feedback thing where he would, if he had to tell you something bad, he would tell you something good first, tell you something bad and then say, oh, but you know, you were really fabulous in that last scene. Yeah. Thinking of your own rehearsals, mm -hmm. uh, and you had just mentioned that one of the things you've had to do is try to forget as much of Shakespeare as yes. possible and focus on this. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your rehearsals are not typical theater rehearsals. No, they're not. They're laboratories. So, um, so we go in just doing the best we can to take the knowledge that you've provided for us, all that research, and try and enact it. Uh, it's been the biggest challenge that I have ever encountered as far as uh, a director and uh, many of my actors uh, have also been <laughs> in pools 
at the end of rehearsal yeah. trying to figure out how to do this. But the lovely bit when you do this kind of work is when all of a sudden somebody goes, ah, aha, like, like Robert Matney's teapot moment, or when Judd Ferris manages to just perfectly trill an R, mm. or Lynn Makeshka learns the difference between, uh, between her dance experience versus flowing from a different, a different type of energy. Um, uh, our actors are remarkable. I, I wish I could name them all. I can't because A, I'll forget one because there's 15 of them. <laughs> um, but the Hidden Room actors are brave uh, and intellectually curious people to be willing to go and turn a document like this into a production. I know we're, we're almost at time. I want to hit those two yeah. questions. This is a good question for you if you know it. I don't know. So Robert asks, who played Brutus in the booth-driven Julius Caesar? Excellent question. I will get back to you. I will find oh, out. People good. out there, someone out there knows. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can feel free, when someone else, uh, feel free to post that. Otherwise, I will get to it when we get off camera. I'll look it up. Uh, Lindsay asks, uh, were there any other plays annotated by John Wilkes Booth? Uh, it's two, two questions, actually. That's the first question. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, he probably would have had prompt books for all of his plays in his repertoire, but none have survived except for The Richard III. We have the prompt book for Richard III here, but there's also another prompt book for John Wilkes Booth's Richard III uh, at Harvard, at the Houghton Theater Collection. So shout out to them. Uh, they were so very generous in allowing me to come and visit and uh, flip through that and take notes from that too. When you read them side by side, there, there's a lot of overlap as you would expect. Uh, but then there's also notes that appear in some and not the others. And can I tell you a discovery I haven't shared with you yet? No, please. I think that there's a specific, this is just a, just a thought, I yeah. could be wrong. There's a very specific difference between the Harvard and your version. Mm. The Harvard version, the cues are almost always a line earlier. Yes. And so right. I wonder if it was meant for somebody else. Yes, <laughs> yes. So my, my hunch, my hunch as to the reason why there's two copies is that the Harvard copy uh, which has signatures from prompters who were like 19th mm -hmm. century stage managers. My hunch is that that was the working copy. That was the one that the prompters were using backstage. Yep. It's uh, the cues are a little bit early so that they can get ready. Yep. Uh, and they're letting people know. This one, the one that we have here at the Ransom Center at UT Austin, this was probably John Wilkes Booth's personal copy. This is the one that he probably maintained himself so that uh, if something happened to the prompter's copy, uh, he would have a backup. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he could also reference it when he needed to. Uh, and that's in incredibly important for an actor as they're traveling. Yeah. The other question that Lindsay asks is, does, it in does the prompt book include ideas about his vision for the costumes? And it's a really great question. It's an important thing to remember that in the 19th century, uh, there wasn't really costume designers. You would only have costume designers if you were building a very special costume for a specific individual for a very specific production. But by and large, actors would tour with their own costumes. They were responsible for their own stock. One of the things that's been really helpful uh, to us is this uh, Reed's Guide to the Stage, which is also published by our good friends at Samuel French, uh, published for almost a century, really, with very few updates uh, in the, 19th, in the 19, uh, 1800s. Uh, this is uh, an acting manual that actors who were wanting to get into the business could buy uh, and it would give them uh, addresses of managers that they could contact to try to get jobs. It would give them makeup instructions. It gives them instructions about how to do these poses, these, the passions, performing the passions. And it also gives them instructions on their costumes, what, what an actor the should have, the yeah. basics that every actor what should, should have, have in their, in your trunk. trunk. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> and Absolutely. it also reminds you not to be an actor that looks out into the audience and waves or you know, points to people, don't say hi up there, just stay in character. Yeah, because it's really interesting that these shows could have been you know, filled with 30, 40, 50, 70 people. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Battle of Bosworth Field, for example, would have probably had a lot of extra actors on stage fighting. Um, that would have just been paid just for that one scene, and then they they go off just a, a sort of a pittance. But yeah, and apologies that I don't have that many um, in our production here in Austin, Texas. But I do encourage you guys, if you are in the Austin area at all, come and see it with us, and come say hello um, at the beautiful Scottish Rite yeah. Theater, built in 1871, with these fantastic hand-painted backdrops from 1876. Um, uh, it is a stunning uh, piece of theater history that's just still alive and operational. They have a Thunder Run uh, that's 
really rare. They have a wind machine from the period, uh, Thunder Run being a, a, a old 19th century, uh, well before that technology, uh, where you have this trough that goes around the ceiling of the theater and then you pop some, uh, some wooden balls in it and it rolls around you and makes this thunderous sound. I, I, we're, I know we're wrapping up soon, but I, I don't want to leave this without asking you a really important question, which uh, for me, this has been one of the, the highlights of our collaboration, oh, so one of the, the yeah. treasures, really. This, is, uh, this could easily be done badly, this sort of scholarship-based uh, performance. It could, be, it could be dry and boring, but it isn't. I want to assure you, Beth has a lot of experience doing this, and it is so engaging and really exciting. But one of the things that's interesting about this is that we're we are learning things about the 19th century American theater, mm -hmm. about Richard III, about John Wilkes Booth, mm -hmm. about, uh, about this period, mm -hmm. reconstruction theater, mm -hmm. that we would never have known if we were just reading the prompt book mm -hmm. in, in the reading room, for example. Mm -hmm. What have you been learning from this by getting it up on its feet? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the main thing that we've learned pretty quickly uh, is you, if we really stick to the directions, uh, despite whatever we might be feeling as a modern actor, if we really stick to the stage directions, and then on top of that we follow the actor's guides, and we really do the best we can, we've learned that there are commonalities and differences in terms of the way we tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that there must have been in the period, as we talked about, that desire for, uh, for melodrama, for something for good and bad, for right and wrong. And when that comes out in, in the acting of it, and it changes who we are. Um, we've, well, another thing I just want to take a quick sidebar here and say, we've learned tools that we didn't have before, mm. that I will, I will now incorporate in every show mm. that I do. Um, gesture is a beautiful thing that's really helpful to have. And um, one of the biggest complaints I get from actors and that I have as an audience member is people that just have two pieces of meat that hang about and they don't really know what to do with them. I know nothing <laughs> well, about uh, you know, that. <laughs> here we are. But gesture allows um, a whole second vocabulary. And if you have another language that you can be speaking simultaneously, why, why would you not do that? <laughs> it's this fantastic. Um, it's this fantastic gift. Um, and then to understand our stories um, and the way we told them through this prompt book and to be given these new tools, it just, again, it reinforces for me that even in one of the darkest chapters of American history, um, and when you're going through a, a dark chapter in American history, what it, what it was like for those people, um, to be able to uh, remember to gain strength in the way we tell our stories together and to remember to, uh, to humanize everybody, um, that it's important not to be so divisive. Um, and this has really been quite helpful in that regard and certainly not to disregard people uh, from the past uh, just because they lived uh, you know, some hundreds of years ago um, because their, their stories are still our stories. And their theater was popular and engaging for a reason. For it, a right? reason. Yeah. And it's still, to me, I'm, I sit in rehearsal with a giant smile on my face watching these old practices come back to life, watching actors, smart actors, resuscitate forgotten practices. I just do nothing but smile on there. So the performances are coming up soon. Mm -hmm. June 15th um, through 30th at the Scottish Rite Theater. Austin Scottish Rite. If, they, if people want to find out more information or buy tickets. Yeah, I would probably go to the Hidden Room website. That's www.hiddenroomtheaterwithanre.com. That's the easiest way. They could also check out information at Austin Scottish Rite Theater if you just Google that. <laughs> yeah, people, uh, people may not be able to make it uh, to Austin to see this. What are your plans after this is done? Uh, we have a couple of plans. Uh, we're really hoping to capture it and have that available on our website so that people can see it after the fact. Um, and we also will have a couple of um, accessible shows where uh, we'll have an audio assisted show uh, towards the end of the run, so please look to the website for that. Uh, and we're working on a captioned show uh, as we speak. Um, we're hoping after this to actually take a, a version of this to universities where we employ the star system, where one of our lead actors will go send a prompt book, a copy of a prompt book, uh, to, uh, to a university, uh, follow behind with some you know, basic instruction on gesture and playing practices of the period, and then work it just like they would have worked it in the star system and put it up on his feet. Great. So, uh, so that'll be teaching 19th century American theater. It'll be teaching 
19th century gesture, mm -hmm. it'll teach Shakespeare, it'll teach mm -hmm. acting. First handling, we think they would have held the line just like we should do now. Not too shabby. <laughs> there's, uh, there's one last question, I oh. think, and we can, uh, we'll wrap it up after that. Let's see if I can pick it up. Jen asks, ah. ooh, of course. Can you elaborate on the Red W in the prompt book? We can, yes. that was fun to figure that out. So prompt books, this is, like I said, not something that comes up very often anymore. Uh, you, you don't see these. So unless you really do research in period uh, theater, uh, you don't come across this very often. There's a whole bunch of different symbols and uh, sort of short phrases that appear in period prompt books um, that once you know it, it opens up a whole new world. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll notice that there's these circles and hashtags that correspond to markings uh, on the, the script side of the page. If you can't see it, you probably can't see it uh, from, from the camera at the moment, but go onto our website. Again, it's been digitized. It's hrc.utexas.edu, and you'll be able to see it on there uh, and zoom in on the, the pictures and flip through the pages. The W is a really interesting thing. Uh, when I first started working on this three years ago, I assumed that the W meant withdrawal because it comes at a moment, usually almost always between scenes. Uh, and so I assumed that it, it was suggesting that the actors left the stage. The W actually means whistle, uh, and this goes back to a very uh, long-standing tradition in theater that uh, prompters would have whistles where they would whistle to change the scenery or the curtains. Uh, this is because uh, actors, or, or not actors, stagehands, stage crew, uh, often worked on uh, ships or on loading docks, uh, and they used a system of whistles to deal with the rigging. Uh, that was during the summer season, which is when theaters are closed, and then when theaters are open, uh, that's when they need work elsewhere, so they all got jobs in theaters as stagehands. And that rigging, that whistle system for rigging uh, sort of transferred over to the stage. Uh, so this whistle would have been audible in the theater, and this is also something that you're recreating in the performance. That's right. We have a prompter who is our modern-day stage manager, then would have been a prompter. He has his own prompt booth that the Scottish Rite actually has, um, so he'll be there, and he has a whistle, a mariner's whistle around his neck, and he's been practicing on the right way to make it do the right sound. Uh, and he, he was nailing it yesterday. I was really proud of him. Uh, and uh, so he'll do that. And then the assistants know to start bringing down, uh, bringing down the drops. And we know that uh, we learned from another piece of research I found here that they would have uh, sometimes worn a bell around their wrist. So, right, all the bells and whistles, and then all of a sudden everything changes, and the bell signifies for the music, so you've got music, and the whistle does the stuff, and then you have all, all the, um, yeah, all the so magic happening. The, the bells cue the, the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so this is, uh, this is one of those things, again, that the audience would have heard, and it's a very different theater-going experience than people are used to now, and it's going to be one of those immersive experiences that audiences will appreciate, I think. It's going to be great. Uh, it's like a time around. machine. I'm so excited. Yeah, it'll be great. Thank you so much, Beth Burns. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much again for tuning in. I'm Eric Caleri. I'm the Curator for Theater and Performing Arts here at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Check out uh, Hidden Room Theater's website. It's the Hidden Room Theater. No, no. Hiddenroomtheater.com. Theater with an R-E. Hiddenroomtheater.com and you can find out everything you need to know. Absolutely. And ask us more questions. We'll answer on Facebook. Yes, later. we'll follow up with more questions. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody.